Today, I want to tell you a story about Final Fantasy XIV. A tale of the raid with one of the most controversial and explosive outcomes in the game's history, the teams that faced up against it, and of kindred spirits standing triumphant. Everything you have. Right? Oh my oh. god! Oh. 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 Stormblood was a transformative expansion for Final Fantasy XIV, releasing in 2017 in the wake of Heavensward's roaring success. Much of what Stormblood accomplished solidified the key pillars of the game we play today. Flashy encounters, acute character and political drama, and a regular weekly content structure with three key endgame difficulties that players could allocate their time into, thanks to the initial introduction of Ultimate in 4.1. And while at the time, it was a fairly divisive expansion, and depending on who you talk to, even today it's considered the shunned child in the family, especially in regards to the main story, there's one department in which I think Stormblood is almost universally praised. The raids were truly peak. The Omega Raid series is by far the MMO's largest amalgamation of Final Fantasy franchise fan service in one single raid. Fan favourite monsters and villains that had been requested almost continuously since launch were crammed into almost every turn. X-Death, Kefka, Phantom Train and more. Everyone was there. Enemies that were considered so AAA that the only way they'd be included was to one day maybe get a full raid series to themselves, and for the most part that was considered a mere pipe dream. Yet boom, Omega just pops them into existence to test your strength. And more than that, a lot of this raid series is so memorable to people that played at the time because it was so good. The raid tiers were not made up of diamonds in the rough where only one or two shining examples stood out. Instead, it was banger after banger after banger. Maybe not this guy though. When you look at tier lists or ask raiders about their favourite savage fights, time and time again you'll see Stormblood raids mentioned adoringly, cool mechanics reference in amongst zealous claims that it was just so good. So when in Endwalker, the Omega Protocol Ultimate was announced to be added to the game in patch 6.3, expectations were through the roof. A minstrel's retelling of one of the game's most beloved raid series, coming out directly after Dragonsong's reprise, one of the most adored capstone moments in FF14's community lore, and the hardest encounter in the game thus far to boot. This new ultimate was positioned to be unforgettable. This race wasn't like the others. This race was different. What was to come was the most controversial race in the game's history with an outcome so hotly disputed that Square Enix themselves got involved. A raid so difficult that it was claimed afterwards to be so hard that it would not be clearable in a party finder setting without resorting to the use of third party tools. This fight will be the first fight in Final Fantasy where third party will be mandatory. As I'm recording this voiceover, this is also the most recent ultimate added to the game. Without another on the horizon for at least another year, it leaves somewhat of a sour taste in the mouths of the FF14 community on the whole. In order to be battle ready for an ultimate encounter, players have roughly one patch of game time in order to gear up to the current best in slot, meaning that they need to gather weekly capped homestones as well as clear and farm the most recently released savage tier for weapons and equipment that are essential to even attempt. For the Omega Protocol, this tier was Abyssos, which was tight enough that many, many groups struggled to meet it, even without deaths. Traditionally in FF14, 
having one or two players that were on the weaker side in terms of damage capability was never a huge handicap, as checks were lenient enough to let most competent groups through if they had a clean pull. But certain encounters in Abyssos demanded both. They demanded that you had a clean pull, and that all eight players were performing their rotations at a very high level. Job balance was also just a tiny bit off, and this tight check exacerbated the issue, leading to a handful of jobs becoming flat out undesirable for week one progression if you are aiming to clear. The expectation was that top would be a step down from DSR, and a step down from the checks present in Abyssos, in much the same way that Ultima Weapon Ultimate had felt like a small step back from the unending coil of Bahama. DSR had been over 20 minutes long all in all, and required close to perfection throughout that entire runtime. Tight damage checks, back to back precise execution mechanics, and unforgiving pacing were rampant. It was considered an impossibility that the newest encounter could be somehow harder. Many world race groups didn't expect to need more than a week of paid time off work in order to complete progression, and they allocated their time accordingly. Speaking of the teams, let's introduce a few of them now, and as others pop up later on I'll give you proper breakdowns. Kindred are a world racing group that rose to prominence across Endwalker, consistently being one of the first streaming teams to cross the finish line, which eventually culminated in their stream first Abyssos clear. Let's go! Get out of here! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! They were a clear favourite going into the Omega Protocol, and they were expected to be one of the places to watch to see new phases and mechanics showcased. Kryl were the group that were the first on Twitch to clear Dragon Song's reprise, featuring popular FF14 streamer Arthurs. Nice LB, nice LB! Nice LB. Yes, and they too would be racing this time around. This Japanese-speaking roster were also expected to perform very well, and alongside Kindred, these were the two streaming groups with the highest expectations riding on their performances. As is true in practically every online group-centric game ever. Groups form, disband and remake, with a lot of the same faces shuffling amongst one another. Pairs and trios and partial groups sticking together for years on end, while others come and go. The period between DSR and the Omega Protocol had been tumultuous for thoughts per second, long considered the best group in the world, before they were dethroned by Neverland in 6.1. Having disbanded as a result, with numerous members stepping back from the game in general or moving on to new challenges, the remainders of TPS had reformed with a few new additions, and whilst they and Neverland would not be streaming, both would be competing for that coveted first place finish once more. I don't intend on covering non-streaming groups in too much detail in this video, because I feel like it detracts from the story I'm telling, but there is one more non-stream group that I absolutely need to introduce it. There's a Japanese group that managed to claim world first in Abyssos, and their name was, ironically, unnamed. Remember that name, or, uh, yeah. And they, alongside countless other dedicated world progression groups, were getting in their final sessions of preparation and counting down the days until January 24th, 2023. It was natural to practice by rerunning the old Omega Savage fights, using them both as a memory refresher of challenges that could be incorporated in the upcoming encounter, and as a good way to stay in practice. But in the weeks leading up to the Omega Protocol's release, when preparatory patch files had been added, something really interesting happened. Certain parts of encounters best showcased by Final Omega here, just broke. Let's show a side-by-side -side comparison, versus how it looked after the patch files had been installed, and the way the fight had been intended. A number of essential telegraphs and visual indicators just disappeared. What could this mean in relation to Ultima? With that question swirling around, game time was approaching, and nobody knew quite what Skrenix had in store for them. All that was universally agreed upon was that the final ultimate of Endwalker would no doubt be a race to remember. The Omega Protocol opens to the muted backing music of Deltascape. 
throwing you immediately into the fray against Omega in its beetle form. This isn't the start anybody was really anticipating. This form of Omega was the boss in O11, as in the penultimate turn of the entire raid series. Would Omega's summoned creations appear in later phases, or would they not be featuring at all? They made up 10 of 12 fights in the original raid, so it felt a little from left field if they didn't see inclusion in some way. If they weren't featuring, how on earth would Square Enix manage to stretch Omega across an entire ultimate? There wasn't much time to scratch heads and ponder though, because the moment instances successfully loaded, the very first top pulls begun. Almost immediately, Omega began casting Program Loop, the dreaded mechanic set to plague every single pull for the next thousand or more. Towers spawned in seemingly random positions, tethers spewed forth from the boss, and players were marked with first, second, third or fourth in line on their debuff bar, and all of this was in sets of two. Two tethers, two towers, and two of each number on the list. Everyone also gets a special looper buff. When the tethers go off, they explode for a pretty massive circular AoE around whoever they're attached to, reducing the maximum HP of anyone inside by 99%. To prevent the raid from going boom to a tower, a player with the looper buff needs to soak it, and it'll do a decent chunk of damage to them in the process. These tower and tether pairs happen four times, back to back. The resolution of this on paper is very simple. Each player will need to take a tower and a tether at some point in the mechanic, but they need to space out the tower taking and tether grabbing in order for the debuffs and the damage to not overlap and cause what we in the industry like to call a series of unfortunate events. So the threes would take the first tethers, and the ones would take the first towers, and they would continue sequentially like that. Remember, we got first through fourth in line, take your inline number, that's the tower, add two to it, that's your tether. What made this mechanic such a constant hurdle was also what makes people dislike Phase 1 even in farm to this very day. The mechanic had so much randomization and intrinsic messiness that it just required a lot of focus in every single pull from the very beginning. You needed to remember on every single cycle if you had a job, what that job was, and then coordinate with the other random player who had the same job as you at the time. If you didn't have a job, you needed to get out of the way without accidentally yoinking a tether or standing in a pulse, which can be harder than it sounds. Healers had to spot heal the right people at the right time, and the people they needed to triage changed every pull. It was one of those mechanics which was just an absolute mess, and it felt like the only initial successes were due to players pulling through by the skin of their teeth thanks to some intense adjusting. In time though, priority systems were developed, and a level of comfort was found. But it wasn't the easy autopilot mechanic that many come to expect from the first minute or so of encounters. It took focus and awareness, and it became quickly tiring when it needed to be played out correctly for 15 plus hours per day. Um, speaking of consistency. <laughs> <laughs> Panther Crater immediately follows this, a souped up rendition of Omega's pinnacle mechanic from its original iteration in O11S. Players once again get the funny numbers from the previous mechanic, but this time they'll also get a rocket debuff and a debuff signifying they'd be targeted by a stack. Players would split into groups of four, dodging the rotating flamethrower AoEs as a party, and ideally surviving the absolute chaos of circular puddles dropping on players. When your rocket debuff timer got low, you needed to get the hell away from everybody else or bad things would happen. Holy. And otherwise, you needed to stay mostly grouped up in order to survive the three-man stacks going off at the same time. There were a million ways to solve this, and while some were definitely more effective than others, it was clear that this entire phase, at its core, was all about synergizing your movement with the rest of the party and quickly adjusting to debuffs effectively. From among the four running stream groups, almost everyone had slight differences between their strategies. And some chose all out chaos instead. I don't have a spread. Yeah. <laughs> Run. <laughs> I tried to aim at you. Oh shit, I didn't. Okay. Healing here was tight. This was at a time before healing ranges were increased, so propagating your mitigation and healing to the light party on the other side of the room could be tricky, 
lead to many electing to stack almost every mitigation to avoid accidents. After this came Omega's third and final mechanic. This one, thankfully, was simple. Huge, repetitive tank buster cleaves splashed on the two furthest players, while the remaining six get targeted in sets of three by random line AoEs. You could solve this by adjusting, and this was what early prog groups did, but fairly quickly, the most lazy strat imaginable was developed. Stand and let thing resolve. It was brutal, but at least it was quick. The entire phase from start to enrage was merely two minutes long, but it was quickly discovered that these checks were definitely not the big step back from those present in DSR and Abyssos as had been expected. These damage requirements were tight. If you somehow managed to recover a death without the mechanics themselves spelling your doom, you'd fall victim to Omega's atomic ray shortly afterwards, instantly wiping the pull. And because the entire phase before it was so full of randomization in your positioning, a lot of the burden of the success or failure quickly fell to the healers, because they had the most limiting movement in most compositions, and they had to deal with triage. They were by far the most negatively affected by bad patterns or mishaps in terms of damage contribution, and those groups with healers that could quickly adapt were the ones to push closer to transition the fastest. With a limit break one dumped that would surely need to be saved later, but keeping that was a problem for the future, one group managed to break the barrier first. BRB Chinese New Year, the group featuring comfy streamer Stahl as well as Koya Koneko from the stream first clear of the Epic of Alexander. This was a static full of faces that were no strangers to the Final Fantasy XIV world prog scene, and they were proving their calibre here, just as they've done in the past, by being the first to pull ahead of the pack and see the transition to Phase 2. Have a watch out. Let's go! Get it! Get it! Are you <laughs> coming out? In a bold attempt to understand the source of our power, Omega reconfigures into humanoid shapes, taking the form of Omega M and F, and together, they will be your next opponents. Just like in the original raid series, Omega M and F open up the phase with a defensive firewall, affecting each player with a packet filter. You can only deal damage to the Omega form that you do not have an active packet filter for, in essence splitting the raid in half and preventing you from dealing cleave damage aside from those first few essential GCDs. Once the filter is in place and one terrifying pair of tank busters later, Omega leads into its first major mechanic, one which I feel somewhat sets the pace for this ultimate and acts as both the first real wall and a standout example of why Top was said to be truly unique in terms of difficulty, Party Synergy. Right, so spread out and try and get a good good view. You see those, those two females look identical to me. Okay. Yeah. All right, just keep going now. As soon as the bosses become untargetable, you're bombarded by visual overload. PlayStation markers, tethers connecting players in the party together, the appearance of Omega's eye on the outside of the arena, Omega M, F, and numerous clones, all spawning in tandem. And on top of that, there's party list buffs, and some of the spawned Omegas have unique signature weapons or forms, swords, shields, staves, or scythe legs, which will correspond to different shaped arena floor hazards. Let's just say that the cast name of Party Synergy was very apt, because this mechanic was going to be a trial and a half. After quickly avoiding the floor hazards, which go off just a little too quick to be comfortable, you need to find the eye quickly because it's about to beam straight through the middle of the arena, rendering only small sections to its left and right sides safe. If only it was so simple to just scatter to the sides though, from the debuff list, the party will either have mid glitch or remote glitch, meaning that they need to be either far away or a medium distance away from their tether partner, the one which shares a PlayStation symbol with them. Because each will explode for a small circular AoE around them on the resolution of this, it was exceptionally tight in terms of positioning, and thanks to the glitch debuffs in place, it was finicky too, 
and can be very difficult to quickly discern exactly how far or how close you needed to be without a lot of practice. And I mean a lot. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. If this were the end of party synergy, it would feel fast and punishing but very manageable. But this was only the halfway point. After this, even more clones spawn, and you're once again tasked with deciphering the mess of information. Without a trained eye, it felt impossible to quickly understand and digest. An Omega F in the middle of the room is about to knock back the raid, and you need to fulfill the requirements of mid and far glitch once more, adjusting at random to ensure that the two new stack markers are split between both light parties, and that those light parties are in the tiny safe spots, avoiding the, once again, too quick to be comfortable AoEs from the new Omega clones. If I went into the priority systems and trial and error the forum and groups had to go through in order to solve party synergy, I'd be here all day, because this mechanic wasn't merely a war. It was one of the most difficult mechanics the game had ever seen up until this point. Everything felt just a little too fast and too precise compared to what came before it, and the only way to consistently get through was to bash your head against it until it became muscle memory. With so many possible permutations and so much information that needed to be quickly distinguished and acted upon, people who couldn't react quickly became immediately apparent. The saving grace was that this occurred so early into the fight that it was quick to get back there after a wipe to keep on practicing. It was at this point that the community was realizing just what they'd gotten into. If every phase was as difficult as what had been shown so far, this ultimate was said to be the most difficult ever. A cut above even Dragonsong's reprise. Everybody was stuck here for a while. Viewers would hop streams to find a good pull, but without fail, for a good solid period of time, even if they came close, one part of the hurdle would trip them, they'd go boom, and then suffer the loading screen back to phase one. Kindred and Otternuts were two groups here at the forefront, both trading cleaner and cleaner attempts between one another, getting one player through, then a few, until eventually Otternuts managed to sneak through and see the cast of limitless synergy. Not to be easily beaten though, Kindred caught them up merely a dozen minutes later. Oh fuck. Wild pitch. Like sort of tethers and yeah, an AoE. Sagittarius era. The race was on. Otternuts were a group that had been slowly rising to prominence across the last handful of races, building their pieces carefully, honing their collective experience, and at last, this was their time to shine. Featuring ex-RuneScape streamer I Trolled You, who was the main POV for them here, Otternuts had finally found their special source. As Limitless Synergy begins, the packet filter in place drops, meaning that both M and F can be freely attacked. Or can they? Almost instantly, Omega F begins channeling her enrage, laser shower, with a one minute long cast. Slowly but surely, your doom comes, and Omega M jumps to her defense, laying down passage of arms and protecting her from all incoming attacks. If you want to thwart her plans, you're going to need to go through him. More clones take shape around the arena edges, ready to attack. One of the clones will begin to execute a Sagittarius arrow, a mimicry of Bard's limit break at a random party member, which must be avoided whilst the two tanks need to simultaneously grab, bait, and cool down heavy tether telegraphed optimized blade dancers away from the rest of their party. Should you survive this onslaught from three of the Omega copies, then follows optimized meteor, marking three random players with flares which deal heavy damage when they eventually go off. And yet another M clone prepares beyond defense. One by one, the clones mount their assaults, each a heavy limit break level attack by its own right. Beyond defense will have the clone leap on one of the closest players to them at random, then quickly combos it with pile pitch, a group stack on the closest target at the time. The person that took the initial Beyond Defense leap must quickly shuffle out of danger or they'll be insta-killed, and the rest of the party needs to stack in to take their place. Then comes the final part of this foray. A pair of clones will flank Omega F as she continues to prepare Laser Shower, and they will both cast Cosmo Memory. This hit in Savage was absolutely terrifying to behold, and in Ultimate it's no different. 
shields and mitigators necessary is an understatement. With all their tricks surpassed, there was nothing left. It was just a pure race against time. What would finish first? Laser shower or the boss's HP bars? And during those first handful of attempts, where players fell or hadn't built up a full understanding of the sequence of events they just slogged through, the only HP bars that ended up empty were the parties. Eventually though, the gap was shortened. While this didn't happen right away, fairly early on, it was deduced that actually, those three flares didn't do as much damage as you'd expect by any means. It wasn't just possible to survive them, it was possible to stack them up on the party and take all three to the face. That is if you used basically every single mitigation on top of each other. Because Cosmo Memory and the Meteors going off have less than 15 seconds between them overall, it meant you could have near enough everything cover both hits, reducing the strain of the phase immensely. But what was the real difference maker from the outset was that right at the end of the phase, 2 minute raid buffs become available, meaning that if you got there with everyone alive, you could rely on a huge surge of damage to help you with that final push should you need it. But this was a temporary measure, as it would mean that you then couldn't carry them into whatever came next. There was a risk to using them here in the long term without thought, but in the short term, it gave them the push they needed. Kindred capitalised on a good pull, sent their two minutes and played their very best, and at last with that, Omega MNF fell, and the group that slayed them got to see phase three for the very first time. Yes, boys. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's go. Get ready. Get Let's ready. Go. Every shield and mid. Shield and mid. Yeah, do your single target. Do your single target. My single thing target. is in one second. Oh. Oh, oh my god. Watch out. Level check. Oh. 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 What the? Oh. Sniper oh. cannon. Kind of. This was where the stakes began to rise. This is where the race started to get really interesting. <laughs> Having been defeated once more, Omega momentarily returns into goop and begins to reconfigure. It concludes that the humanoid forms were maybe not best suited for strength after all, and instead chooses another, more monstrous form. As it begins to take shape, its defense systems whir into action, pulsing AoEs that need to be dodged out from the middle of the room, catching the unaware kindred off guard. Players are marked with debuffs, signifying they'll be hit shortly by various sniper cannon shots, and they must spread or make two-man stacks while dodging the pulsing AoEs and attacks by the arm units that Omega sent out. If somebody accidentally gets clipped, the sniper shots ricochet, blasting other party members with collateral damage and forcing you to limp into the next phase. We were here. Phase 3. Final Omega. Well, that's new. Is that supposed to happen? Turns out that as Omega reconfigured itself, it forgot to properly bug test before going live because a fairly nasty bug reared its head right here. As a small spoiler, this would not be the last bug that would appear during the race either. As soon as Omega became targetable, it would instantly auto attack, and if it happened to hit a healer or DPS with that auto attack, there was a high chance that player would just immediately die because of how much damage it did. This was clearly not by design. In Final Fantasy XIV traditionally, when an aggro reset occurs and a boss becomes targetable, it's pretty standard for the boss to wait around for a couple of seconds before attacking, allowing proper aggro to be established, so situations like this did not occur. But for some reason, that wasn't the case here. There were even moments where Final Omega would decide it had a grudge against a specific player, spin 180 degrees, and bonk them to death. There were certainly ways around this, but they were janky and they shouldn't have been necessary in the first place. Having the tank position themselves inside the hitbox, directly in the boss line of sight as it spawns, and having them spam, tab and provoke to quickly evoke the boss became standard, as the rest of the party nervously congregated around the back and sides hoping that everything went smoothly. As an aside, a few days later this bug would be fixed, but not without leaving its mark in Raider Psyche's first. 
While it made sense that the natural progression after M and F would be to see Final Omega, this certainly felt strange on the whole from a pacing perspective. We were merely 5 minutes into the encounter timer at this point, and all three Omega forms had shown their faces. What on earth was yet to come in this ultimate? We still had probably two thirds of its runtime left to go, and it felt unlikely that the summoned trials from earlier Savage turns would feature at this point. Viewers and players alike were excited to search forward through this phase and see what would happen next. If there's one mechanic that everybody was equal parts excited for and dreading in this phase, it was the inevitable reveal of Hello World. This mechanic in O12S was infamous, combining overwhelming debuff vomit with numerous timers and requiring you to decipher, solve, and adjust. And in the Omega Protocol, it was the very first thing you were hit with. As the Hello World cast ends, each player receives 3-5 to five debuffs, making your buff bar an absolute mess. I'm not going to list every single one of them and what they do here, because a lot of these debuffs have very little effect on what you actually need to do in order to progress, but I'll give you a few tantalising examples that the first groups had to break down and figure out. Critical performance bug, latent synchronisation bug, cascade in latent defect, code smells, local regression, you know, nice obvious stuff. You could never accuse Square Enix of being obtuse. In terms of what actually happens, one cycle of Hello World plays out as follows. Two players get blue Rot debuffs and two players get red Rots. Rot is passed via touch, like some incredibly virile disease, and if you trade it to the wrong person or at the wrong time, it's going to cause a wipe. You need to trade it to a very specific person and at the right time to allow them to carry it as long as they need to, and then move away as on expiration Rots detonate a circular AoE around the player that had them. Rots will also have either a shared debuff or a defamation debuff, which is a huge circle AoE when it goes off, so they'll need to either stack with another player or spread away. There will be two tethers connecting pairs of non-Rot characters together, one of them will be a blue remote tether, and the other will be a green and red multicoloured local tether. Blue tether pops when you move too far away from one another, and the green red tether pops when you move too close. They take a while to activate, so you have a little bit of time to get into position. You will need to pop both of these tethers before they expire, but they do heavy damage and also apply a vuln for a handful of seconds, meaning that you need to space out the tether snaps amongst the other mechanics in the phase in order to survive both the incoming damage and the debuffs. Lastly, there's these four huge puddles that you may have noticed, two red ones and two blue ones and they must be soaked by a rot of the same colour to avoid an instant wipe. So all of these components and debuffs and timers, tethers and rots and stacks, they all come together into a little dance for players to perform. Rots rotate into their puddles, avoiding other players along the way. The two people with the blue tether will go between the puddle occupied by the rot colour that has stacks, and green-red tethers will stretch their tether to the outer sides of the defamation-occupied puddles. Once the puddles, stacks and defamations go off, rots will pass to their nearest tether player, and tethers will snap, one after another, ensuring to wait for that uncomfortable vulnerability to drop off and for healing, but as fast as possible besides that. All of this constitutes one single cycle of Hello World. One single cycle of a total of four. That's right, you have to juggle all of this four times in total, in which each player will at some point get to do every possible job. If you're having trouble remembering all that, here's a little song that Kindred Spectators cooked up to help you remember. Red is defamation. Red is defamation. Pass rot, pop green, watch the rots. Red is defamation. Towers two. Pass rot, pop green, watch the rots. This is Towers 3. Red is defamation. Pass rot, pop green, watch the rots. This is the last set. Party is going to blue. Red is defamation. You can pass through each other freely. Pop blue. Watch the rots. Party stack. The thing about Hello World is that once it's been solved, surprisingly, it's actually the most relaxed first half of a phase in the Omega Protocol thus far. Because you get to practice every responsibility in every pull, a random targeting mechanic becomes one that isn't frustrating to learn. It's quick to get reps on, and consistent once you become comfortable with a specific cycle to do it correctly every time. 
The main challenges were healing. Because the arena was so absolutely massive and individuals were spread far and wide, propagating shields and mitigation could be tough. The regularly used solution here was to let the healers inch deeper inside the boss hitbox in order to cast their essential triage. But this meant, if they had rot, they were another dangerous hazard to avoid. Speaking of main challenges, rots. If there's something that makes people just compulsively need to stand on top of each other in FF14, it's when they have a debuff that prevents them from doing so. Accidental rot trading caused a lot of wipes here for early progression groups, while they worked out the kinks and figured out stable, consistent traffic rules. Soon enough, a clean four cycles was successfully carried out. As the groups crept through Hello World in one piece, they were quickly met by Iron of Flux, a heavy raid wide which would follow into the second major mechanical onslaught of the phase. One interesting thing of note though, was that there were leftover debuffs, debuggers still affecting each player and they had not dropped. It was clear that they weren't needed yet, but would they be utilised in some way a little later down the road? Usually once a mechanic is fully resolved, the debuffs relating to that mechanic will drop or expire, but in this case they just hadn't. It was food for thought at least. So it's time we take a little break from progression to talk about another issue a few groups were becoming aware they were having. Kirana's Tivoli, a long-standing European staple in the world prog scene, were the ones to initially bring attention to it. The core of this group existed and have been solidly playing together since all the way back in Heavensward, and they were also streaming, because I was in the group streaming the race. Let's watch this clip. Do you notice anything funny? That's right, those are the buffs from abilities and raid buffs, missing on a player in the party. They have a 100% chance to hit, and this should absolutely never happen with no exceptions whatsoever. Except there is an exception. Final Fantasy XIV has a maximum number of buffs or debuffs that any player, NPC or enemy can have active on them at any one time. You'll never hit that in general purpose gameplay, because how would you? but there were specific instances with large scale player counts where especially boss buff caps could happen in the past, the most egregious of which being Delubrum Regine and its Savage version. Well, thanks to all those little bugs Omega infected everyone with, in party comps that used a very heavy raid buff stack, or even healing jobs like Sage which applied a number of buffs in their healing and mitigation, it was possible to hit that cap. And while in the past it could be an annoyance, here, in content with tightly tuned DPS and mitigation checks, losing your riddle of fire, or your astro cards, or your bloody shields could be a death sentence. This caused a number of job changes among some of the groups that were deep into P3, as they didn't want to deal with the frustration of having their fate out of their own control. Ok, back to prog. Next came monitors, another mechanic that was present in Savage. In O12S, the boss will point its hands in a direction, visually displaying monitors and the tanks need to soak the hits as it targets two players in its cone of vision. Interestingly, this was one of the mechanics affected by the visual bug that we saw before proc. In top, that concept is the same. Omega is still cleaving half of the room, and two players still need to soak it to survive. But three random people are also affected with monitors of their own, and those three guys have each got to hit two and only two people with their monitors, because if you get hit twice, you die. Like almost everything else in this fight, when the monitors went off, you needed to be spaced out as you'd be hit for an AoE around yourself. This led to some tight positioning requirements, the ability to quickly adjust and good control of your angling if you're a monitor yourself. It didn't help, but for many, 2 minute raid buffs were up here, and because your monitor would aim based on your facing, you had to be very, very careful. And after this, unceremoniously, Final Omega led straight into its Enrage cast. Okay. okay. That was lucky. Get that was up. very, very lucky. That's fine. I don't even have time to pass this. It turned out that those two minutes I mentioned at the end of the previous phase were about to become very relevant, because in order to meet the check here, you either needed to carry those buffs over to this part of the encounter, giving you two uses to chunk Final Omega or you needed to burn a DPS limit break 3. Without one of these being fulfilled, this early into release, it was practically impossible to pass. And so, once more came the execution war. Top was tight. Everybody needed to be on point, 
clean and execute their rotations optimally. I've mentioned it before, but I just want to stress that this ultimate's DPS check was just far beyond anything before it. It wasn't insurmountable, but it certainly pushed groups to find those GCDs of optimization where they could, those tight positionals, and cut back on those overheals. And Kindred pushed through the barrier first, cutting short Final Omega's enrage cast. I got Swift. I get him. Okay. DPS. Just DPS, just DPS. Yeah, this is easy. This is for. Walk, Fred. Yeah, go ahead and spread in any mid that we still have. I had a flash. Maybe. Really done. close. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Wait, is this it? Oh, my Wait, gosh. this is it. They did it. Initiating system shutdown. This is the first time we've seen this live. Oh, you were here, he's chat. Back. Oh, my God. Can we get audio okay, so... on this? Resurrects, defeat unacceptable. Oh, stack, like some stack lines, like parties. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs>as its body crumbles beneath it at the end of phase three from your battle, its systems beginning to initiate shutdown. Omega refuses to accept this as the outcome of its testing. It couldn't just fall, like this. That was unacceptable. This is where the Omega Protocol deviates from the plotline of the source material, with Omega rebooting, removing its inhibitors, and continuing the fight against you, regardless of its structural integrity. The phase begins mere seconds after the previous ends, and both in mechanical complexity and in length, this is the shortest and most simple in the entirety of this fight. As From the Heavens blasts in the background, reaching its crescendo, wave cannons shoot from the boss, thick line AoEs that target each player, requiring them to spread. As these go off, two random players will get line stack markers, and they'll need to stack together in spots that no player initially occupied, because the wave cannons will shoot a second time at the same positions where they initially struck. The pulsing circular AoE originating from Omega that players saw in the transition to Phase 3 reoccurs here, instantly killing anyone that's caught within it. This mechanical combination happens three times in a row, with shifting timings of dodging the pulsing circles and wave cannons, and each individual hit deals high damage to players. Because everyone is spread, shields need to be carefully applied as players come together for the two stacks, and then enough defensives needs to be given to them as they spread once more to set them up to take the next incoming hit. Once you survive the three sets, dodging into the wave repeater's pulse, Omega casts blue screen, wiping the raid. Reset. The first groups sped through this phase, taking only a handful of pulls to reach blue screen. The epic nature and fast pace combined with the music felt like a culmination of everything that had come so far, and it definitely got the adrenaline pumping, but despite the speedy prog, no one even came close to passing through the phase. For most, the boss was still sitting at 30-40% to HP when it enraged. Even when the party got there fairly cleanly, it was too tight. It felt impossible to chunk off so much additional HP. Something was wrong. It was at this point that the community began to discuss. Was this the puzzle mechanic of the Omega Protocol? Was there some additional necessary mechanic to prevent a failure state? In past ultimates, some form of puzzle mechanic at some point was fairly standard. In UCOP, you had to push Bahamut below a certain threshold to avoid his damage up in final phase. Ubu had three entire primal awakenings to deal with, T had the Enigma Codex, and DSR had a rewind and the requirement to not kill Thordon late in the fight. It was only natural that Top had one too, and because this felt like such an insurmountable wall, it made sense that this would be it. A tank LB was attempted to mitigate blue screen, no dice. At this point Neverland, the group that hadn't been streaming, but had been tracking their progress via the FFLogs competition page, reached phase 5, promptly vanishing from the race page within moments as they did. It's exciting though. We, know, we now have confirmation that Neverland is in Phase 5. They clearly figured out something that the others hadn't quite yet. They'd been stuck on blue screen for no less than 20 hours, according to the page. So the solution couldn't be simple. It was time to think. Theories were abound from competitor and viewer alike. If you tried to complete Phase 4 without hitting Omega, preventing further damage to it, 
Would that prevent that final desperate cast of blue screen? No. It was impossible that Healer LB could have any positive effect. Eliminated. What about those buffs we talked about earlier? The debuggers that didn't cleanse after finishing Hello World? They stayed on the players throughout Phase 4 too, and while they seemingly didn't have any effect in combat, they could be important. Considering that a blue screen was often the byproduct of a bug, and the buffs you were carrying over into Phase 4 were debuggers, it certainly stood to reason that one potential option was to carry over a certain number of those buffs. Maybe then players could survive blue screen, but actually doing that would be a strategic nightmare. Not only would you need to completely redevelop a new Hello World solution, the complexity of which would drastically increase to the point of being nigh impossible, if you somehow made it through that, you'd need to deal with somehow solving leftover defamations during monitors. Not happening. That wouldn't work either. Some groups sat back and pondered, but most focused on what they could do. The best pulls were reaching around 31% on the HP bar by Kindred, but if LB3 was saved for Phase 4, which could be done with a clean and confident Phase 3, that should get lower. That could chunk off a decent amount. And regardless, even if they couldn't solve the phase right now, they could build consistency to be in a good position going forward. So the pulls kept going. This wall stood, and more and more groups caught up. Practically all of the four running groups at this point were pushing against the phase, chaining pulls, theorizing, or both. The charity stream for the world race was holding whiteboard sessions between the commentators, discussing possible solutions and tinfoil hat theories. Promising pulls were traded between pretty much all the groups I've mentioned by name at this point. Low dodge, very slow. Calm. 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 <laughs> Back and forth, closer and closer, chipping percentages here and there, but Omega still stood, and it wasn't even close either. Even getting to this point was an insane consistency check. It was tough to chain pulls here without slumps in between. And then, with the whole FF14 raiding world watching, Otternuts pulled this out the back. Wait, wait, wait to move in. in, in, in. Alright, pump everything you got here. Sure. Everything you got here. Under 19, 20. 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, which necessitated great execution in everything that had come before. Instead of reducing the HP to zero, you just needed to bring Omega past that magic 20% threshold, which would reduce the potency of its blue screen to make it survivable with mitigation. And as the dust settles, both you and Omega, having reverted back to its MNF form, take a moment to catch your breaths, completely and utterly awestruck, glowing resplendently gold, Omega has been pushed to its very limits and beyond, and has emerged out the other side, changed. It could only be one thing. Dynamis. A whole new world has opened up to Omega. This was the power the Warrior of Light had used to defeat it, and what a power it was. But how far could it go? Where was the limit, and could Omega implement this new knowledge into its battle portfolio? More testing would be needed. Phase 5 opens with F warping away, and the newly gold-clad Omega M instantly launching a tank swap required to Hitbuster, before casting Run Dynamis Delta, an insanely hard-hitting raid damage before the boss leaves, and the familiar components of a trio fill out field of views. Every ultimate, at some point, has factored in trio mechanics, named after their inception in Yukob, when Bahamut, Twintania, and Nail would come together to attack you, with intense mechanical combinations of each of their signature abilities. Usually, you'll get multiple trio mechanics in a single phase, with the boss leaving its HP in the mid-80th percentile before this, and Delta taking its namesakes from one of three raid tiers in Stormblood, it was clear that this would not be standalone. 
Just as a disclaimer before we talk about Dynamis Delta, this is a complex sequence of events, and I'm not going to go through every single detail because I feel we'll miss the forest for the trees, but what I do want to do is put you in the position that prog groups were in when they tried to solve this. Beetle Omega spawns on one side of the room, Final Omega on the other, and the Eye on the outside of the arena, and shortly afterwards Fists will spawn a few feet behind each player, colour coded either yellow or blue. These Fists are an advanced iteration of the ones from O11S. In the original, the Fists will punch the floor where their targeted player is, and in order to destroy them, you must make two punch one another. If you do it too slowly, they enrage and wipe the raid. The exact same is true here, except you only get one attempt instead of three, and one fist of each colour need to hit one another. Four players are chained in pairs with the code smell of the blue tether, and another four in pairs with the green red tether code smell. This means that during the mechanic, four tether snaps need to take place throughout, while fulfilling the spacing requirements until that point comes. There are two new debuffs as well, Hello Near World and Hello Far World, which will become important later. As the fists go off, arm cannons spawn around the intercardinals and north-south of the arena. Six of them, and you need to put a player close to each one to aim them outside as they spin, shooting beams towards the closest target. But having your players bait them means that somewhere a tether is going to snap, and you need to pre-position your players for their fist mechanics as the eye is beaming the middle of the arena at this time, and if you don't, it's impossible to get to the arms in time. Strat reshuffle. You get through this, you do the fists, snap the first tethers and bait the arms, but then Omega M jumps on a guy ping-ponging him and instantly wiping you. It seems like it's the same pile pitch jump that he did in phase 2, in which he randomly selects one of the closest targets to attack. He spawned in the middle of the arena as the previous mechanics resolved, so you needed two people in the middle to bait, and then at least a few people to take the stack afterwards. But there are additional challenges going off at the same time too. Omega is telegraphing a monitor attack on a random side of the arena, and he's also just thrown a monitor on a player too. So now four players need to soak those monitor attacks, and of course, they go off at the same time as the pile pitch stack. Another strat reshuffle from the ground up to factoring this new information. This was how blind trio prog traditionally went. You'd build a semi-working concept based off your current information, push it to its limits, and then try to burn your invulnerabilities or res cheeses to see as many seconds as you can, gaining precious information to look at what came next. Then, if your strat no longer worked, you'd make a new one, factoring in the knowledge you'd acquired. Run Dynamis Delta was multi-layered and complicated, and it felt never-ending, with so many moving parts to consider all at once, and to cleanly execute with constantly changing strategies, it was a mess to gain any ground in. By now, over 20 groups had made it to this point, yet not one of them had gotten through. Prog was slow. You could take an entire lockout to see one minor new piece of information, if you were lucky. Meaningful progress dried up on all fronts, and it became a battle against dropping morale on fatigue more than anything else. Groups were trying different approaches, as an example, some players were using four people to bait the six arm cannons, easing the numbers issue, but upping the complexity majorly, while most were using six players to achieve the same results. But in the grand scheme of things, nobody was surging ahead here. Most of these individual components targeted with complete randomness as well, meaning that it was an absolute nightmare to get through consistently. Minutes turned to hours, groups slept, woke, and continued bashing their heads against a multitude of problems. Once you got through everything beforehand, Beetle Omega would telegraph an angled half arena cleave and something entirely new and terrifying would happen. The Hello World buffs would hop. New telegraphs never seen before of little jumping circle AoE spewed from them, seemingly at random, and if a player was hit twice, or if anyone was caught in the initial, larger AoEs from the Hello Worlds, everybody exploded. But that wasn't the most interesting thing. When Dynamis hopped, it left the player with a stack of quickening dynamis, with no duration nor loss state, even on death. Now we're talking. The first stacks of quickening dynamis obtained on stream were a revelation. Everybody went wild. It was clear that you'd need to collect these throughout the phase, potentially on one player, or maybe spread the stacks evenly amongst the party. It was also eventually solved that the Hello Near World would hop to the two closest players, and the Hello Far World would jump on the two furthest players, and you needed to fulfil these strict positioning requirements while the Omega Cleave went off, 
and at the same time dealing with any leftover tethers. If you did it all correctly, you'd come out with 6 players possessing one stack of Quickening Dynamis, though you couldn't with 100% control dictate who those players would be. These Dynamis stacks were to be the signature mechanic of Phase 5, and building them up over time evenly amongst the party would be of the utmost importance. There were so many moving parts in this mechanic that it was overwhelming. With that said, it was actually pretty elegant in how it all played out, and satisfying to do as well. Getting through this part of the phase alone took multiple 16 hour prog days, with the fastest groups needing around 250 pulls from first seeing phase 5 to cleanly passing Run Dynamis Delta, but Otter Nuts eventually broke through, seeing the boss respawn and immediately phase into another crushing tank buster. Before I move on though, I want to talk about something that happened early in phase 5 progression, because it was both shocking and pretty interesting. Before groups had seen most of this for themselves, in-game, the following video leaked on Billy Billy. It dictates practically the entirety of Run Dynamis Delta, not being done correctly, but being showcased by a solo player using some form of god mode to avoid death. As a note, even using some kind of private server against Terms of Service would never be able to replicate these kinds of results. This was the entire mechanic with all of its assets, animations, and practical effects working as intended. This was no small task to fake or put together externally. It had to be an internal leak, much like the internal leak before the Dragon Song's reprise world race, which led to both the loss of jobs and legal action being taken. The fact that this happened twice in a row during ultimate world races was utterly bizarre. As the next major cast approached, the pull timer at this point was finally ticking over the 10 minute mark. Ultimates were usually somewhere in the 16 to 19 minute region, which meant we were well and truly in the second half of this battle. Another run Dynamis activates, this time Sigma, as boss HP ticked to around the 60% mark. Once again becoming untargetable, the Omega Squad rolls in to set up for their next attack. PlayStation symbols reappear from Phase 2, two arm cannons spawn in the room and snap their aim to the two furthest players, ready to attack. Omega M leaps to the outside of the arena, final Omega to the direct center, and Beetle Omega opposite its humanoid counterpart. On the buff front, the mid and far glitch buffs appear once more, as do Hello Near World and Hello Far World. Red markers appear on heads, final Omega cleaves each person with one of them, and then you likely wipe. Because iconography within an encounter often works the exact same way when it reoccurs, almost all of this we instantly solve. Mid and Far Glitch, which does its first of what is assumed to be two resolutions, goes off right as Omega does these big cleaves at everyone. We know the PlayStation markers will be tethered together, and that in order to avoid going boom to the wave cannons from Final Omega, the raid must spread around it, with the PlayStation simultaneously solving the distance requirement. The last component is those arm cannons. They target the furthest person to them with a beam of their own, and conveniently, Exactly two individuals do not have a floating red prey marker above their head. The difficulty here is that like with almost every challenge in top, players are randomly assigned for each responsibility. This resulted in conga lines and quick adjustments being used to get into those necessary spots fast. After this, everyone will get the loop above from phase 1 once more, and towers will spawn in one of two configurations. Omega F spawns, does a knockback from the center of the room, and the second resolution of the mid-far glitch occurs. This happens a mere handful of seconds after the last set of mechanics resolve, and because mid and far glitch went off at the same time, you couldn't just throw bodies and fill each tower and be fine. You needed to set the entire party up in very specific configurations to fulfill the active glitch, each tower being filled, and the fun little twist that I didn't mention yet. Some towers needed one person inside, and some two telegraphed by the number of spinning little orbs on the outer edge of the tower. This was a real tough cookie to crack. Pulls bled into hours, bled into lockouts. The goal for a full day of prog would be to even come close to overcoming this wall. Some even leapt into the comforting embrace of coil turn 4 to simulate the knockback configurations, valuing building some semblance of muscle memory over continuing to pull. Others kept their focus firmly inside the instance, making efforts to see Sigma as many times as possible. Otternuts and Kindred were the two groups trading blows throughout Phase 5 until this point. Neck and neck, a battle of minds, two groups and their support players, inching along, 
trying their utmost to refine their strategy and make the magic play that would get them through. Otternuts managed it first, yet again. This is new best Paul. We're gonna see more mechanics. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Okay, oh my gosh. okay we, got the, we got the big wings in the middle. It's gonna be a spin. Hand to crater, maybe. We got hands on the outside for lasers. Big eye laser through the middle. Gotta dodge that one. And outside of that, oh, it spins, it spins, it spins. You gotta dodge. And then there's <laughs> the slashes in between. And of course, the dynamis debuff sets go off. Beautiful living dead popped here by Death Snail still, just to stay alive. alive. Then the hand lasers come in and Omega F spawns. Oh my god. And then just running around. No! The end of Sigma Trio had been reached. But despite seeing the finale of this multi stage nightmare of a trio, there was still an entire section to learn and clean up. Luckily, this part was the easiest by far. The rings around Final Omega appear in the middle of the room, and after a while they shoot a massive rotating line AoE, killing anyone caught within. Omega F uses her weapon telegraphed AoEs from Phase 2 in tandem with this, and two more arm cannons spawn. Hello Near World and Hello Far World at long last go off here, meaning you need to position your party in such a way that allows them to bait the dynamis hops and avoid all the hazards at the same time. This was fairly simple, and there were a number of different ways to do this, so this final part posed no real long-term threat. With that, 12 dynamis stacks were obtained, albeit somewhat unevenly. This is where the second major auto-attack bug that plagued groups during progression popped up. It certainly wasn't as bad as the one in Phase 3, but because it occurred so late, directly after so many difficult trials, it was way, way more frustrating to experience. When you took a hop of one of the Dynamis buffs, you got a vulnerability up for a few seconds. This was clearly intended to prevent a player being cheeky and intentionally baiting multiple stacks on themselves. But it came with an unfortunate side effect. If the tank with aggro took one of the final hops from either near or far world, there was a chance. Yes, this wasn't completely consistent by any means, for the first auto attack from Omega F to hit them before the Vuln had fully dropped, instantly killing them. It could be mitigated by forcing a tank swap if this were to happen, or forcibly adjusting your setup to ensure the tank would never take the final hop. Kiranas Tivoli publicised this, with Xeno bringing a higher level of attention to it by making a video when it happened to him during Prog 2. This caused some disagreement between different groups, as some claimed that it was clearly intended, and that those that had the bug occur to them were just not playing around an intended mechanic. While there was no conclusion reached during the race, Square Enix put a stop to any conflicting opinions a few weeks later by confirming it was a bug, patching it out of the game, and permanently solving the last massive Omega Protocol glitch. Just like before Delta and Sigma, a tank buster and raid damage combination follows this, and that means that yes, there's going to be another Run Dynamis mechanic right afterwards. Interestingly though, as Run Dynamis Omega's cast bar ends, the boss does not leave and continues to auto-attack. Not only that, but a 2 minute burst phase comes up here too, meaning groups will need to deal with what comes next whilst not only maintaining their rotations, but while doing reopeners and moving the boss around. Two players get Hello Near World, and another two will get Hello Distant World. These have different timers, which will also be represented by an accompanying first in line or second in line. Final Omega will spawn in the centre of the room and begin casting Diffuse Wave Cannon, a large cone AoE that hits two opposite cardinal directions. It does this twice in succession, alternating the safe spots with each hit. At the same time, two sets of Omega M and F clones will spawn on the intercardinals, once more sporting their various weapons from Phase 2. They'll execute in sets of two at the same time as the cleaves go off, so you'll dodge three combined attacks, then dodge three more. This mechanic was simple to understand, but thanks to the overwhelming amount of visual stimulus in such a short space of time and the speed with which it went off, it could be really difficult to instantly figure out the safe spots. Luckily this was easy to practice, because by this point an LB3 was available. The majority opted to tank LB or hyper mitigate for the sake of prog, allowing them to be hit here and still survive to see what came next. Then, Omega F becomes untargetable, and Final Omega, in the centre of the stage, telegraphs monitors for a third time. You then need to solve Hello Near and Hello Far World, as well as the requirements of monitors at the same time. If you make it through that, Beetle Omega spawns on the edge, extending two blaster tethers, and the other Near and Far World would reach zero and go off. By this point, it was fairly easy to deduce what the true goal of Quickening Dynamis was. 
with four total sets of debuffs appearing, each providing six stacks that gave you a total of 24, and dividing that by eight was three per player, a pretty standard and comfortable number to have. This quickly became the de facto goal. Because you couldn't dictate exactly which players had a specific number of stacks going into the start of Run Dynamis Omega, it meant that quick, on-the-fly organization needed to take place during those earlier dodges. In order to avoid mix-ups or communication mishaps, most solve this by having one or two players take responsibility for checking the debuffs and selecting who would go where, either via callouts or manually marking. Once this system was implemented, it quickly became by far the fastest trio to prog through and the easiest to gain consistency on. At last, raiders were able to catch a break. As the forerunners were getting close to this point, prog had reached and surpassed the one week mark. The amount of time that Dragonsong's reprise World First had required came and went without incident, proving the insane difficulty that Top posed. Putting a phase with such massive hurdles like Delta and Sigma so late into an encounter felt like a sadistic choice, because the sheer time investment required to attempt them was utterly daunting. This was what really set the Omega Protocol apart. Phase 5 was the toughest ultimate phase to progress in Final Fantasy XIV history, and it was claiming its victims one by one. Generally, FF14 avoids backloading encounters too much in order to keep them palatable, but here, the hardest really was in the heart of the third act. Groups were starting to run out of paid time off, some becoming overwhelmed by the mental slog this race had been, and others were hitting the point of frustration where disagreements began to break out. One by one, they fell, the herd thinned, and amongst them was Otter Nuts. Despite having pulled ahead of the pack and proven their caliber as one of the top two streaming teams in the race thus far, their available time to dedicate to 16 hour days was over. For them, it would be evenings only from this point forward, removing them from contention entirely. It was crushing, but these are the realities of hardcore ultimate progression in the current landscape of intense difficulty. One week is often just not enough. Then, it happens. Just over a week after release, a reported clear came in. World first. Somebody did it. Not only did they do it, they must have been a country mile ahead of everybody else, because nobody on stream had even made it to the final stretch. It was unnamed. The Japanese group that I said would be important almost an hour ago, right at the start of the video, were the first static in the world to become alpha legends. Other racers and spectators alike flocked to congratulate them, well aware of what a huge achievement this was. It was a great moment for the Final Fantasy XIV community, and there was nothing that could spoil this wonderful scene. Oh no. Just as a little aside, this was originally posted on YouTube, but it's long gone. This is a mirror. The original was uploaded to a YouTube account with a rough translation to Divine Punishment, or Retribution, and includes footage of the obvious zoom hack, raid buff timers visible, as well as player hitbox pinpoints, which was uploaded before their clear even occurred. Clearly this footage had been shared by somebody within the group who had an axe to grind for whatever reason. This was very bad for them. The usage of third party tools in FF14 is very explicitly against terms of service, and while there's no form of anti-cheat in the game, Square Enix have been known to actively take action against those to be proven to be utilising it if it's put in their field of view. And a world first group, in the Japanese scene where the development team was based, provably using something much more egregious than just ACT was a concern. What eventually came to light in a semi-confirmed rumour is that one of their support players outed their third party usage as revenge. Unnamed had multiple bench players, and they had reached an agreement to be taken through the fight by the main group once the first clear had happened. At some point that agreement had been broken, and the offer was suddenly no longer on the table, resulting in the ninth man unleashing his secret weapon that he'd stockpiled for some reason. There must have been some real internal tension for things to rise to this peak, and I certainly don't envy them. The Japanese community did not take kindly to this. A Twitter criticism storm begun. Huge arguments broke out across the community, and players began to harass members of the group on alts in the form of big naked rogadons, covering up their attempts to show off their new weapons in Limsa. Some members of Unnamed then took to social media to explain themselves, 
And I make a note here when I say these may not be fully 100% accurate translations. They include a very short apology, a fairly non-committal, well, other groups use them to section, and then explain that all members of the group share solidarity and take the blame equally. Then, Naoki Yoshida himself made an official statement on the FF14 lodestone. Now this was serious serious. He noted that an official investigation would be undertaken and they would enact temporary or permanent account bans to anybody found guilty. He reiterated that third party tools are considered utterly unacceptable by Square Enix and acknowledged the leaked god mode video that spread early in phase 5 proc as well as a leaked video showing the fight's ending cutscene which had been obtained through game manipulation and that once more, they're being investigated. He then closed out the statement with his personal thoughts on the matter, noting that he, as a gamer, wants to be able to cheer on races and proggers, but when things like this happen, he will not acknowledge the world race or its winners for the foreseeable future, and that in this case, he does not recognise Unnamed as the world first Omega Protocol clear. I'm not going to get deeper into the third party debate that I think is a hot topic right now because this is neither the time nor place. I do however plan on discussing it in future, in a more appropriate scenario, but it's indisputable that what happened on this day definitely brought a whole new level of attention to the issue. A similar situation occurred during the Epic of Alexander, where the world first group used a third party plugin that automatically moved markers for them. And they were not directly penalised, but instead, the entire FF14 community was. The ability to place markers in combat at all was completely removed in the next patch. But this is the first time direct action was taken against players for failure to comply with terms of service in a world first clear. Speaking of action taken, here's what happened as a result of all this fallout. Offenders who were part of the group, but not the leaked POV, were contacted by GMs and told that their accounts will not receive penalty, but their clear will be revoked, including the loss of their achievement and title, and they were ordered to discard their top weapon. That's right, the GMs did not remove the weapons, they made the players do it themselves. FF Logs and the charity Wolverine stream also removed Unnamed from the race page, deleting their first place ranking entirely. Numerous players from the group, past and present, or even those associated tangentially, either took extended breaks from the game, deactivated their Twitters, or in rarer cases, deleted their FF14 service accounts entirely. We got some good memes out of it at least. This meant that, in the eyes of most, World First was still up for grabs. This wasn't over by any means. Groups were still pulling the boss, streams were still live, and there was still everything to play for, even if it had been somewhat tainted by the events that had gone down. The emotional roller coaster that had been spectating the events of the last day had been something to behold, even for players, but this was their opportunity to shake it off and really make their mark. And make their mark Kindred did, capitalising on Otternut's withdrawal from the race and their constantly improving level of consistency in Phase 5. They pulled out this excellent pull, pushing Omega below 20%, the HP percentage everyone assumed to be the success threshold once more. The Enrage here pushed the raid into the Wall's death zone, and as the cast goes off, hearts in their throats, they waited, watched, and witnessed this at long last. Let's fucking yes! go! Let's, Let's go! fucking go! Let's go! Oh my god. Alpha appears, attempting to comfort the truly defeated Omega. However, the tests are not over. Not yet. Omega F absorbs Alpha, having unlocked the powers of Dynamis and transformed into Alpha Omega, combining elements of each form that came before it. This is Omega's ultimate form. Now it's time for your final evaluation. In this phase, 
Alpha Omega brings its full force to bear, not holding back for even a moment. Each new cast throughout this phase is accompanied by dialogue from the boss, as it narrates and embellishes on the sheer magnitude of the attacks it harnesses to defeat you. The encounter opens with Cosmo Memory, a massive raid damage that instantly kills practically everybody who hit this point for the first time. It deals a flat out unsurvivable amount of damage, but there's a twist. You can carry a Limit Break 3 into this phase if you don't use it in the previous part of the fight, meaning you can throw up Tank LB to survive the hit. But that's not all. If you were diligent throughout the duration of Phase 5, building stacks of Quickening Dynamis on each player and entering this final battle with 3, your buff will transform upon witnessing Cosmo Memory, evolving into Brilliant Dynamis as your own powers spark and flare into action to protect you. If a player with Brilliant Dynamis uses Limit Break, it will regenerate just a handful of seconds later, expending most of the potency of the buff. It also has the secondary effect of extending the tank limit break to last for the rest of the phase. As long as you maintain your Dynamis buff by not dying, you're protected, and it's the only way to survive the mechanics in this final phase. This means that each player can contribute one limit break to getting through what's to come, and then you get one final second use of an LB by a person to expend that gauge for the last time. Cosmo Arrow begins concentrating the piercing rays of 10 million suns towards you. People quickly started to refer to this as exasquares. Initial telegraphs go out, showing one of two patterns, and then they pulse, and anyone caught within their trap will fall immediately. The most realistic way to deal with this was memorization and repetition, watching footage back and developing a rhythm to follow in your mind, while keeping an eye on the incoming Cosmo Dive cast. Hero Mega brings forth the velocity of a worm, bringing forth the Dragoon LB animation and right as Exasquares finish resolving, dropping AoE busters on the two closest targets and a huge stack on the furthest. The party is ideally setting up their mitigation midway through these dodges in order to get skills on cooldown, because Phase 6 is tight when it comes to mitigation checks, especially for tanks. One late cooldown can often just flat out spell an instant wipe. The group will then need to stack in the middle in preparation for unlimited wave cannon, Omega's attempt to scorch you with the fires which incinerated the Dragon Star. These are exaflares. Lots of exaflares. Covering the entirety of one side of the arena edge and blasting through the middle. To survive, you need to loop around behind them as a party, avoiding the chasing circle AoEs that follow you. After getting through, Alpha Omega hits each player individually, chunking their shields and health and requiring a loose spread before finishing off this barrage with one last wave cannon. A party stack which needs the tanks at the front, mitigating the much stronger hit on them. After the initial attempts to thwart you failed, the combinations begin instead. Cosmo Arrow and Wave Cannon repeat, this time acting in tandem, forcing you to spread while dodging, the final blast baiting out tank invulnerabilities and requiring rapid heals. Then comes Unlimited Wave Cannon into Cosmo Dive, and should the party survive, Alpha Omega proclaims to you to witness the extent to which it's evolved, beginning the cast of Cosmo Meteor as huge AoEs drop under each player, adds in the form of Comets and Meteor Spawn, while intense damage rains on everybody, forcing them to spread and the healers to expend valuable resources. The only way to destroy these Comets and Meteors in time is to use Caster and Range Limit Break utilizing the caster to eliminate the smaller comments and deal significant damage to the meteors, and then the range limit break to shoot through the boss and the two remaining larger meteors. Three flares appear as the range is preparing their limit break. The five unmarked players need to stack, and the group must adjust around whichever mechanic the ranged has at the time in order to keep everyone alive. Magic number occurs twice after this, which needs a tank LB3 on cast to survive, then a healer LB right afterwards to cleanse the resulting debuff. And then, all its experiments concluded, all its tricks encountered, Alpha Omega cycles into Enrage, and it's a simple DPS race for the win. Mechanically, Phase 6 did not have a high level of complexity, but rather than supremely difficult to understand or even execute, I would call it punishing. It asks for a good deal of the player, and if one person mistimes their mitigation, forgets something or positions poorly, it does not allow you to recover. You're done. Come back in 15 minutes. That is if you're able to consistently get there in the first place. 
as groups crept across the entrance to Phase 6 one by one, beginning their path to progressing, optimizing and learning, it was just a matter of time. Whichever static managed to make it through this marathon cleanly, with enough damage, would be crowned. And the first to make it on stream? Next up is Magic Nari's Number. Nari's LB. Nari LB followed by Komachi. It's gonna be easy faint and add Nari LB now. This is Komachi's LB. Watch, wait for the debuff. LB now. Ow. LB. Next up is going to be Bagel LB into Carrot LB. It's gonna be Nari Rex. Kali will LB after Carrot. Buffs and pots if you have it. Remember the pot out. Tree. LLB. If you have not caught it, now is the time to do so. Technical in five. Spend everything you have. Surely this is it, right? I don't know, just hit it. Hit the, the fucking boss. Tree! 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 Get me my fucking chair! Get me my chair! Get me my fucking chair! Yeah! Let's go! Kindred, their journey had been long, with over a week and a half between their first pull and the last. But they had done it. They were the first stream team to claim victory. And as they cheered a sigh of pure relief and caught their breath, the victory cutscene rolled. The Omega Protocol will be remembered forever, for both the good and the bad. It has brought some of the most intense individual skill checks Final Fantasy XIV has ever seen, and it came together in a package which is, as I'm recording this, the hardest fight in the entire game. There were ups and downs, triumphs and sobering moments, the controversy which occurred with the World First group, the leaking of the third party usage, and both the resulting storm of criticism and Square Enix's official intervention into the affair painted a concerning picture for the world race going forward. 
and the encounter itself pushed the limits of what many felt was a reasonable expectation of the player base to come up against. In particular, the usage of automatic markers via third party tool became rampant to solve the acquisition of quickening dynamis in phase 5, and a good percentage of criticism related to that has fallen on the fight's design. Kindred would stick together, and keep performing well in upcoming Endwalker raid progressions, making for an incredibly successful expansion for them as a group. And I'm sure every player will look back on this progression, on everything they achieved together, on the moment they became the very first on-stream alpha legends with the world at their backs, and smile. And for me, what the Omega Protocol did more than anything else is make me excited for Dawn Trail and what comes next. When it comes to Ultimate, I think the best is yet to come.